Hello, greetings. Um, as I was reflecting on what and how to share this evening, I had a very long, very good long weekend. <laughs> a lot of, uh, ran a really wonderful therapy workshop intensive and then started a course. So it was all good things, but it was a lot. And so I was a little weary today and I thought, oh goodness, what am I going to do tonight? I remembered, oh yeah, tiredness is actually a really fantastic field of practice. And I might not be the only one experiencing some tiredness or exhaustion. So um, that's that's the inspiration <laughs> this evening or whenever folks are watching this recording um, is, to, is to take our whatever is a little tired or full out exhausted physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Some of us may be exhausted on all those realms at the same time. Uh, and to just hold that front and center without having to push it away to do the thing we're supposed to be doing or, um, you know, power through until we can really rest. But to let ourselves rest here and now. Um, and not just rest in a like tune out, zone out kind of way, but with gentle presence, allowing, but also curious, investigating. Because um, I found once, once I realized that tiredness was not an obstacle to practice, but it could be the practice, it was um, very transformational, but it took me a good 15 years <laughs> of hearing that I could practice with tiredness to really do it. Because <laughs> my mind usually said, oh, I'm just too tired. Okay, I'll, I'll come back to the cushion when I when I've had some sleep and there's there's time and place for sleep. Um, but there's a there's also time and places that that befriending and exploring tiredness can actually just be really interesting, even liberating. So I want to start with a poem this evening. I don't know if some of you are familiar with this uh, recent book, The First Free Woman, which is translations of the Terragata, the uh, First Awakened Nuns, Verses of the Elders, is the translation. And there are many translations, but this is kind of a more poetic translation, not so literal, that Maddie Weingast did in, um, yeah, 2019, I think it came out. Um, so it's fairly recent. And this is the poem, the awakening poem of the Bhikkhuni Genta, known as the Conqueror. I was forever getting lost until one day the Buddha told me to walk this path, you will need seven friends. Mindfulness, curiosity, courage, joy, calm, stillness, and perspective. To walk this path, you will need seven friends mindfulness, curiosity, courage, joy, calm, stillness, and perspective. For many years, these friends and I have traveled together, sometimes wandering in circles, sometimes taking the long way around. There were days when I thought I couldn't go on. There were days when I thought I was finally beaten. It's scary to give all of yourself to just one thing. What if you don't make it? Oh, my heart, you don't have to go it alone. Train yourself to train just a little more gently. In my heart, you don't have to go it alone. Train yourself to train just a little more gently. So 
So this training just a little more gently is, uh, is also central to this evening's practice. And I think it's actually central to all of the path of awakening. So often we're trying too hard or else collapsing and giving up in small ways and big ways. There's trying to pay attention too tight and then it gets anxiety provoking or tired, tiring and just kind of space out or give up and, and this back and forth of too much, not enough and learning to stay gently. It's very, very important for learning to center and tranquilize or not tranquilize to find tranquility in the mind. <laughs> um, so that there is some energy, some effort, but not so much. And especially being raised under coloniality and capitalism and, and patriarchy and all the isms. You know, most of us have only ever learned the strive kind of effort because that's all that's really rewarded and taught. And then we go from the striving, grasping to the collapsing in big ways and small ways. And the meditation instructions and invitations of finding this gentle effort, trying just a little more gently, continue more gently and more still more gently um, is as appropriate to working with the inner functionings of the mind as it is, you know, with most relationships, any social change, any whatever we're involved in, whatever big tasks we have to take. I'm sure I don't have kids, but raising kids, goodness, that seems to be quite the continue more gently because <laughs> you can't do these things by, by striving. It doesn't actually work, even though it's the model that we're so often taught. So I want to invite us actually into what in the Plum Village tradition we call total relaxation, kind of like a body scan. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can do it sitting up or lying down. You could do it standing too. It'll be about just around a half hour's practice. Eyes open, closed, screens on or off, whatever makes you comfortable. <clears throat> and even as we begin, just start by tuning into how is tiredness present or not present in you? Is it noticed? physically in any particular way. You may be delighted to find that there isn't any tiredness and even the absence of tiredness can be noticed and explored just as much as variations of tiredness. For me, there's heaviness in the eyelids and sort of a, a dullness in the core, heaviness in the legs. To see if there's any physical manifestations that let you know that tiredness is present or absent. In the hindrances, this is known as sloth and torpor. obstacles that can be met and understood and befriended. And once we befriend them, they are no longer obstacles. This is pretty simple. So if there is tiredness, manifesting physically, notice if there is also a reaction in the mind to the tiredness. It may be something along the lines of, go 
awake. <laughs> or, hmm, maybe I'll just go sleep. <laughs> we don't need to judge our reactions, but we are inviting broader and broader awareness, mindfulness of things as they are. So I'll invite three sounds of the bell. Let the body have a few full breaths, if that feels okay. Full inhale, stretching the lungs. Full exhale, releasing. Sometimes the most precious thing we can offer ourselves in any time of tiredness are a few deep breaths. Just meeting things as they are. Offering the nourishment of taking in oxygen, releasing carbon dioxide. This miracle that keeps us alive. And if it's supportive, you can let your breaths stretch a little deeper for as long as you like. And there's a sense of either completion or just wanting more ease. Um, you're welcome to let the breath move into a natural flow, body breathing itself. And bring awareness up into the crown of the head. The scalp. And while a standard body scan involves staying still, if at any point there are any areas that you're exploring in our practice that want a little extra care because of tiredness or anything else, you're actually welcome to just bring your hands to the area and offer some care if that feels wanted. So starting at the top of the head, Noticing the sensations, inviting awareness in. To the sides of the head and the back. 
My brain's a little tired, so having my hands on my head is feeling a little nice. Maybe remembering someone who has offered soothing, loving touch, like letting their hand reach out and cup our face or rest on the forehead as we explore sensations in the face. Perhaps inviting the Buddha or the earth or Kuan Yin to come in and support us as we're in this practice or hold us, offer a loving embrace or anything that feels wanted. Coming down into the neck and throat. the shoulders, down to the arms and hands, And sometimes tiredness sort of saps us of energy. So there may be areas that are dull or heavy, but sometimes tiredness gets us stuck in patterns of tension, like we're almost trying to hold up the tiredness. So if you come to any spots of extra tension or holding, see what it'd be like just offer a little more softness so come into the chest the diaphragm mid and lower abdomen. And whenever attention wanders, travels, explores elsewhere, just do I just notice where it's moved to? That's just what minds do, not a mistake. And then can we train ourselves to train just a little more gently, gently inviting attention back to the upper back. If you're lying down, maybe letting the body sink a little more fully into this, that surface. And if you're sitting up, also let the body rest a little more fully to the chair or cushion. Exploring the mid back. Lower back. buttocks and pelvis, hips.
Again, just getting curious, investigating how it is right now in this felt sense. Even with tiredness or bracing or pain or ease, training just a little more gently to stay with the moment's experience, coming into the thighs. And some parts may not feel tired at all. Sometimes that would be a surprise too. So what does the quality of non-tiredness feel like? How do you know in the body? Not just with the stories in our minds or memories of the day we've had. How does the body tell us? express tiredness or neutrality or vitality. Moving down to the knees, calves and shins. down into the ankles and feet. Feet that have maybe done a lot of work today or maybe they've been <laughs> sedentary. There's even a tiredness that can come from being too still as well as the tiredness of taking on too much or having to carry too much. A good friend of mine was telling me of her early days when her son was an infant and she was parenting solo. And there were times where she was so exhausted. She thought she would, I mean, her words, she thought she would lose her mind. And whenever she would turn to the practice, she couldn't focus on her breath and she couldn't do a lot of the formal practices, but at one point she realized, okay, I can know what it's like to be exhausted in this moment. That's something I can be present with because that's all there is. And it shifted her experience. She was still pretty exhausted for many years. Um, but when she started holding this awareness of, oh, this can be my chance to understand an experience, a difficult experience, a chance to understand dukkha. And by understanding it, living it, meeting it, rather than being afraid of it or avoiding it, it can become a doorway to liberation. She removed the second arrow that was telling her, how do I, I was saying, how do I get rid of this exhaustion? And she just got to meet the exhaustion as it was. And it changed. She was training herself to train more gently with reality instead of a fantasy or a cultural script. So we're going to move back up the body. And however the experience is, 
we bring in the in mindfulness and the investigation, the curiosity. And see if there's a way for that to, to arouse a little courage, which is one of the translations of virya, energy. In our poem, the seven factors of awakening were given an alternate translation of mindfulness, curiosity, courage, joy, calm, stillness, and perspective. These seven friends can be with us whenever we remember. So let's bring some mindful, curious, courageous, joyous, calm, still perspective. Let's move back up the body. Feet, ankles, this time in touch with the felt sense, but also the larger reality. Maybe finding space for a little appreciation for these feet that likely do a lot for us. Can we practice some non-taking these bodies for granted? non-taking life for granted. The anti-entitlement practice up into the shins and calves and knees. Even if some parts are injured or ill or depleted, we still offer care, maybe appreciation, maybe an intention of, of taking more care. And seeing if that might be a a doorway to invite in a little of the, the joy, awakening factor of joy. Not forcing or faking, just opening the door and inviting in. Up into the thighs. Attentive, curiosity with courage. Fighting, opening the door for appreciation. Care, tenderness. Coming up into the pelvis, hips, buttocks. Mindful curiosity. Maybe there's some calm stillness you can notice that just as much as the aches and pains and depletion coming up into the low back Middle back. Up 
upper back. Maybe noticing the strength of the spine or the stability of the dignity of the spine. Offering some appreciation or intention for greater care. Just marveling at the miracle of the human skeletons that we all <laughs> live in. Coming into the front of the body, the low abdomen, mid abdomen, this area with our intestines and so many organs. Your room for a little thanks, sense of wonder, an intention for care. up into the diaphragm and the chest, home of the lungs and the heart, these vital organs that just know how to keep going, at least most of the time, even if there have been a few blips, if we're alive, they're doing, they're doing pretty well. Maybe even just offering a half smile to the heart and lungs. If that feels more genuine than inner words of thanks or wow. Coming down into the fingertips. into the hands, if there's any extra anything, extra tension, extra effort, extra resistance, extra excitement. Can it be a gentle release and just return to the bare experience? A little, a little appreciation. Coming up into the forearms and the elbows. upper arms, really bathing the body with awareness. That is his own form of nourishment and care. Staying with, gently, tenderly, training to be with. It's 
as much as ease as we can muster. Up into the tops of the shoulders, the neck and throat. Softening or bracing. Stepping back a little bit from the habitual efforts to fix or fight or flee discomfort. The habitual patterns of social engagement and reactivity that, that stay in our bodies. Coming up into the jaw, the mouth. The cheeks and nose. into the eyes, the temples, the forehead, the eyebrows, simple awareness bathing these areas with awareness. It's opening the door to see if there's a little room for appreciation or ongoing care or marveling. To the sides and back of the scalp. top of the head, And all the way back up to the, the crown again. Let yourself explore the whole body, taking the big picture. Is there more tiredness or less tiredness or a similar amount? That's when you began the practice. Can this be some information we gather of, oh, maybe I'm more tired than I realized, or, oh, maybe this stillness is more rejuvenating than I realized. How, however this moment is, can we release any notion that tiredness, exhaustion, fatigue is an obstacle to practice? And rather stay open, 
curious, maybe even a little enthusiastic. What's it like when tiredness shows up? Tiredness in the body is not separate from tiredness of the heart and mind and spirit. Given everything happening in the world today, it'd be surprising if there isn't any fatigue, emotional fatigue, as well as maybe rage and fear as we face so much of the violent impulses manifesting, the horrors of seeing people's lives and homes destroyed on the news and climate disaster. There are many responses and at some point we get tired and this tiredness deserves care. Our tired and sore hearts deserve care. Oh, my heart, you do not have to go it alone. Train yourself to train just a little more gently. Staying with bringing curiosity, courage, mindfulness to all that arises. Nothing needs to be left out of this path. And whatever seems like an obstacle can actually turn in to the doorway to deeper awareness, deeper understanding. So keep turning towards whatever feels like it's in the way. There are any parts in your personal body or the collective body of humanity that needs some extra care. Let's take these last few minutes to send care to the inner parts and the outer parts of our body of humanity. As the poem said, we don't have to go it alone so we can also invite the earth spirits, the bodhisattvas, our spiritual teachers, all of our ancestors to hold us, maybe to do the caring for us or with us. Even if we don't have strong connections to the unseen beings, the earth literally is holding all of us in every moment. Perhaps just aware that the earth is holding all the wounded parts and all the healthy, vibrant parts and all the parts in between of our shared human body. Can we receive the care of gravity as a force of love?
tapping into the medicine of awareness, the medicine of tranquility and perspective, medicine of calmness and joy, courage, curiosity, and mindfulness. Receiving it within, sharing it all around. Connecting to the great beings. The guides, the sages and saints. This mind stream transmission is always with us, never separate. like the Buddha seed in each one of us is always present, never separate. Even when we're completely exhausted or enraged or heartbroken, as much as in moments of joy and ease and enthusiasm, Awakening is already present, just waiting to be discovered, remembered, acknowledged. Then still you might want to bring some gentle movement into the body, not ending the meditation, but shifting the form, continuing the mindfulness. If your eyes have been closed, you might want to gently start to open them and receive colors and forms with relaxed eyes, but eventually Look around the space, reorienting, stretching the ocular nerve. Maybe stretching the body a little bit, massaging any parts that want some extra care. So let's practice with, with tiredness, exhaustion. It's like practicing with all of the hindrances. Once we meet them and recognize them for what they are, Learn to befriend them rather than belittle or believe them. They lose their power. They actually become places of, of explorations, objects of meditation, as worthy as the breath and the body and sounds and any other object of 
of awareness. Just like the stories in the suttas where Ramara would show up and try to convince someone like, oh, come with me, I'll give you all these other pleasures and take, uh, follow my way. <laughs> And then the Buddha or the monastics would say, I see you, Mara. And then that was it. And then Mara would scuttle away. There was no big battle. There was no need to defeat and destroy Mara. Recognizing Mara is all that's needed for its power to lose hold on us, to lose its grip on us. So if tiredness is is seen as Mara. <laughs> and really anything that's painful at some point is bound to be seen as Mara or um, the personification of our afflictions. The Buddha's promise, the Buddha's path is one of just saying, recognize things as they are. And when it's fully recognized without resistance, without so kind of holding back or hoping to fix it, fight it, flee from it. And these are the inner experiences, not the, not the outer world abuses, but the inner experience of in this moment, there's exhaustion or aversion or restlessness or desire, sensual craving um, or doubt. Goodness, doubt's a big one. The invitation of the practice is to simply go, Oh, wait a minute, this is all. Hello, Mara. <laughs> oh, it's doubt. Hello, you've come to visit again. Okay, interesting. And once we get interested in the spin of the mind that is encumbered by doubt, in the, the heaviness that is sort of braced in tension of exhaustion in the legs, the the shakiness and the almost like flying out in all directions of restlessness once we get curious and investigate go, oh what's it really like not just oh yeah i'm agitated but like where where does the agitation live and what's the temperature and how does it develop and how does it fade away oh so interesting it's not a problem anymore. We have met Mara and befriended it, and then Mara is no longer Mara. But I know I've 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 gone through so many phases of thinking that I was practicing this befriending or investigating everything, and then I'd find a whole new realm in the mind body stream of oh, I didn't realize I was excluding this aspect and. Okay, now I know that I can welcome everything, <laughs> practice with everything. Oh, and then I find another realm. And so, so tiredness was a really big one for me. Um, and I think for some people, it's, it's not such a struggle, but other things are struggles. And the good thing is that the principle is actually the same, <laughs> whatever it is that we struggle with. Um, yeah. And the, the word that we translate to hindrance is nivarana. Uh, and, it, and it's the word for the cover or the lid of a pot. Sometimes I find it also helpful to just bring in this image of, yeah, it's a lid. It can be removed really easily. <laughs> There's nothing permanent and stable and fixed about a lid. It does, it does do something. It does. If you're like holding it up over your head, it would block things <laughs> or, it, you know, holds the, the cover of holds in whatever's inside the pot. Um, but, you know, this is a lid without any snaps. It's not a Tupperware container that, <laughs> that locks down or that sort of seals shut. It's just a lid that moves very easily. Sometimes that too is, is a helpful image to remember. 
and you don't have to destroy or completely transform the lid you just need to move it <laughs> and then it's no longer an obstacle if it's been in the way so this befriending is such a central such a central word um, i think also the compassion especially for our tiredness and our agitation and all the, the hindrances and obstacles, all the sources of suffering within and all around. Before, before trying to even maybe get curious, maybe even more helpful to just bring compassion in. And not just compassion, compassion is everything. <laughs> Once the compassion is, is present and strong, then everything else becomes easy. Because compassion too requires facing fully. Oh, there's something hard here. There's something painful here. What if I turn towards it and see how I can care for it instead of fight, flee, fix, freeze? And I know there had been a question about the, the interplay of Dharma mindfulness and somatics. <laughs> and there's a lot of realms where there it's, it's similar or it's an overlap of this, this awareness of, of things as they are on a sort of granular physical level is really essential to both practices. I find the somatics and all the nervous system work helps me to to recognize a little more fully when I'm trying to flee or fix or fight or for, freeze. And some of the moments um, I can still be judging that tendency gets softened from all the somatic work that I've done of, oh, if I'm a little frozen, that means something in my nervous system feel that like there's an insurmountable threat going on. Even though my brain says, I'll oh, just get over it. What if I respect that something feels like an insurmountable threat, even if it's just for a few minutes or something that my, I don't believe should be, right? And, and let, letting that be a mere a, a softening of all the second and third and fourth arrows the extra things that, that get piled on to that first arrow of suffering so that I can meet it fully. Leaning in to care for the energy of compassion. There can be such an emphasis also on calm in the Dharma and and of course like we want to be able to be peaceful <laughs> calm is, can be a wonderful thing but it's not the only thing we need and it's, it's actually through a lot of the nervous system studies that i've gained articulation of why sometimes i felt uncomfortable with some of the articulations of dharma that we're always focusing on let's be calm and peaceful um because there are also times where it's really appropriate <laughs> to experience anger in the face of injustice <laughs> um, and and i don't want anyone to to be suffering and overcome by it um, but trying to pretend <laughs> to be peaceful and calm <laughs> when rightful anger is arising actually is a second or third or fourth arrow it's it's adding unnecessary suffering and so there's, there's been something about the articulation of remembering but what we want to cultivate is a wise response. I mean, that's central in the Dharma, not central in somatics and trauma healing. Um, we want to be able to respond wisely to things as they are, not only have one response, whether that's one response of our traumatic habits or one response of the Dharma says you always have to be calm in a certain way. <laughs> um, and maybe that's particularly my experience of having been a monastic where there's a lot of emphasis on a particular kind of embodiment and a particular kind of 
consistency of calmness. Um, I'd say like 80% of the time was phenomenal training and 10% of the time, not sure, 10% of the time where I actually think that it was harmful, at least for me and a few others that I know uh, or unhelpful. So this appropriate response, um, I've, I've, I've been helped by the somatic practices to understand the nuances of the Dharma practices of, oh, what's my state right now? What's an appropriate response to the state that I'm experiencing or that I'm engaged in relationally? And there are times when stillness isn't, and, and the bathing experience with awareness, most of the time is like such powerful, amazing medicine. Um, but like when I was very depressed, one of my winters in the monastery, sitting and bathing things with awareness was actually, I think, taking me even more deeply into depression because I just didn't have enough energy. And the, the calming, the stilling, the take it down of a lot of the breath meditation kind of focus was actually feeding more of the depletion that I was already in. Not that, not that you can't find healing from something like sitting meditation in depression, but for me, it was walking meditation, it was moving. <laughs> it was singing loudly that started to um, sort of like bring the energy back up Right, which is still Dharma practices, but I didn't know how to how to navigate my practices as well before I started studying all this nervous system stuff. I can see like, oh, when the energy is like when stuff is collapsed, I need to gently train <laughs> to help lift it, not calm it even more. Right. And that's some of the uh what kind of exhaustion are we going through if that's what we're practicing with? Is it a, an exhaustion of lack, lack of connection, lack of meaning, or an exhaustion of like burning the candle at both ends, but it, it, so it's a simple like, not simple, <laughs> you know, there's, there's different ways that we may need to remedy what we're experiencing. So, um, that's just a very, very short <laughs> reply to the, this very big topic, but I hope that it's supportive in this examination of practicing with exhaustion, because I think so many people are so exhausted these days um, in so many ways. So it's really important that we honor <laughs> the care that's needed and and also Really remember that any and everything can be a Dharma door. Any and everything can be a Dharma door. Nothing can um, destroy the inherent seed of awakening within every being. Make it very, very covered. <laughs> it may feel, may feel impossible to find, but it is impossible to destroy that seed of awakening. So I'll offer three sounds of the bell again, and then we'll close this part of the evening and open it up for conversation, reflections, curiosities. Thank you so much for your listening. And we dedicate the goodness of this time of practice and reflection that this energy may ripple out in all directions, supporting close relations, our distant relations, supporting all those living in war and occupation, living under oppression, living with inadequate resources for food and housing, living with violence, anxiety, depression, all forms of dukkha may this practice energy reach in all directions and offer even just the slightest nudge in the direction of true well-being, true justice, and peace for all. <laughs>